Well, I have the privilege, everybody, this morning of not only uh, substituting for Svetlana and um, as a moderator and host, along with a couple other co-hosts here, uh, and particularly to introduce Clive Oates, who is head of Region Americas for Surrey Satellite Technology Limited. And Surrey is the world's leading small satellite company delivering operational space missions for Earth observation, science, communications, and exploration, which is really interesting. Headquartered in Guildford, UK, it's also part of the Airbus Group, which we all um, probably have some more familiarity. Clive Oates is head of the Regional Americas, as I said, where he's responsible for the company's business across those Earth observation, communications, navigation, and lunar sectors. Prior to joining SSTL, Clive spent over 20 years with Ericsson, holding executive roles in software engineering, technology solutions, and business development working in Canada, South Africa, Sweden, and the United Kingdom. So I think that if I'm not mistaken, that's at least uh, three continents. And today he's <laughs> gonna be presenting on the, as I've just explained, Surrey Satellite Technology and Lunar Pathfinder, a story about SSTL and uh, it being a successful space company, its connection to the University of Surrey an overview of the latest missions and a deeper dive into the Lunar Pathfinder. So with that, Clive, I'm gonna turn it over to you. And I, I know as well as everybody else, really is excited to hear what you have to say. So it's all great. Your yeah, great, thank you very much. So um, so yes, what, what I was gonna do first of all was just just tell you a little bit about um, Surrey, uh, Surrey Satellite Technology. Um, okay. Doesn't want to um, to change slide. Hmm. Just a minute. Do you see? Do you, are you just seeing the um, the first slide, the Surrey Satellite Technology yes. slide? Okay. Yes. When I when I try and advance, I oh wait, maybe it's just very slow. There we go. We saw it advance. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it just blinks on my end and doesn't advance. Which is. Clive, how about you stop sharing and restart the game? Sometimes yeah. it happens. Okay. Okay. Yeah, we see it. Can you try to advance? Okay, it does it, but it then just um, kind of flips back. Too strange. That's weird. And are you using PowerPoint? Yeah, on a just a standard Dell laptop. Um, uh, well, while you're doing, why don't we do this? Um, do you want to email me really quickly the slides and you can kind of start yep. introducing yourself and then I can try and I'll do it on my end and you can just tell me when to advance from that. And my email, I'll put it in the chat here. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Um, strange. Okay. 
For as much as technology, uh, Svetlana and David talking earlier, allows you to be participating from a bus in Switzerland, um, nonetheless, <laughs> there are still some hiccups from time to time, right? Yeah. I don't know why it's... Um... I think I might have to just restart my laptop because I can't seem to now um, access the um, my seems to have frozen for some reason. Well, if you want to do that, then let, 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 let's try that, and I'll just um, I'll just restart. Um, All right, and then um, I believe that uh, he'll be right back uh, with us. But while we're waiting for everybody that happens to be here, I'll um, give you a quick update on Coast Bar, which uh, I happened to return from this uh, past weekend. And uh, the, the first thing that I would say is it took me 45 hours to get from destination to destination from Athens, leaving the hotel in Athens and getting in my back door. And uh, that was, it wasn't the worst travel that I've had, but it certainly wasn't the, the quickest or most ideal. But Coast Bar, as many of you know, is the Committee on Space Research. And it's very scientific focused in terms of uh, there's a lot of it, it's the scientists and the businesses and the organizations and so forth. So um, there was a lot of astrophysics there. I happen to pay a lot of attention to the panels on planetary protection. And there was a lot of Svetlana and they, there was a huge contingent from NASA talking about forward and backward planetary um, protection and all of the many, many missions that are going on. And for those that may not know entirely forward um, planetary protection is ensuring that we don't as earth beings um, bring our bacteria and other life forms that might be destructive to other planets or celestial bodies and then backward planetary protection is for example a real concern here coming up with the um, mars uh, samples that have been collected, bringing something back to Earth that, that could be harmful here. And in addition to the scientific aspects, there was a panel that has been created in Coast Bar. And, and I'm talking as someone that's been there, but it was my first time being there um, on the social sciences and humanities. So although it's very scientific oriented, they have brought in this new panel, the SSH panel. And that allows a lot of other uh, aspects and interests to be brought into the discussion. And particularly from my perspective on the law and policy, it enables um, those kind of uh, issues and topics to, to be brought in. And so in fact, I did give a presentation on, um, I guess two weeks this coming Monday on developing a legal construct for the sustainability of space into the future. And then that also had presentations, a lot of presentations from others in, in that regard. There were a lot of legends that happened to be there in terms of science and planetary protection. Many of you may know or know of Nicholas Hedlund from UNUSA, which is the United Nations Office for Outer Space Affairs. He was uh, there and he actually as um, he's retiring from UNUSA this year, he's the acting director and he'll be retiring. And so right now he's a co-chair of the planetary protection panel, but he'll be moving to the SSH panel. So it was a really, really exciting time. Um, the next big uh, Coast Bar meeting, there's one next year, but the one that kind of is this, the next of the one that I went to, if that makes sense, will be in South Korea in two years. So I will be planning on and going on that. But the next big conference, as Setlana mentioned just a little bit ago, is the IAC, the International Astronomical Conference, which is hosted by the um, 
the International Astronomical Foundation and um, or is it Federation that don't don't uh, don't hold me on that. I was a member. I became a member in Abstentia. My associate um, Amy actually was present last year and um, to to accept our mud law becoming membership. But Satlana and Dave were there and that's actually where they've met our current speaker and as they were indicating the next conference that is coming up nearly a year now is going to be in paris beginning in just several weeks um, in september so looking forward to that here as we wait for clive to to return but I'm looking forward to being in Paris. Hopefully it'll be a little less hot. Setlana and Dave, since you're still there, is how's the heat and everything in Switzerland? It's not as bad as uh, it was apparently about two, two days ago before we arrived. It was over 100 Fahrenheit uh, heat uh, here in Basel uh, or in uh, Luzern where we just left. So we're looking forward to slightly lower temperatures, but I think it's still going to be hot. Yeah, that is that is hot. And um, that reminds me of the last time that I was in Paris, it was so hot above 100 that we pulled in front of, we had been walking around and I had been forcing the family to walk from site to site and uh, which, I had some grumblings on. And so we actually pulled up in a taxi to see the Eiffel Tower, got out and kind of shook our heads like, OK, that's the Eiffel Tower, got back in the taxi and, and went back to the air conditioned hotel room. So this time we're hoping to have a better exploration of of the Eiffel Tower. What was interesting in Athens for Coast Bar is um, there was one night where the hotel, the, the restaurant, there was a restaurant on the rooftop along with the pool deck. And once I saw the view, that's where I was hanging out like every night um, just to see the sunset and the Acropolis, the sunset behind the Acropolis um, offset just a little bit, but it, it was behind and, and behind the mountains. And, um, and again, we're waiting here, everybody for Clive to rejoin us. But one night, I think it was Tuesday, um, it sunset occurred around 820 thereabouts. And then, uh, you know, it was after last light, it was an hour and a half after the sun had set and there was still a red glow behind the mountains. I'm like, that's really strange. And I had heard some sirens and I had heard somebody talk about fire, but I thought it was just a, you know, a city fire. And then I go into the hotel room and put the news on, Greek news, um, just to see what was going on. And it was the fire, forest fire that had got down to hand that was just 12 miles um, away from Athens encroaching and, and coming over the mountain. So that glow, the sky glow, we've often talked about sky glow in, in this context from light pollution, was actually the glow of the fire at night. Uh, Hi. Hi, folks. I'm back again. Let's um, great. Let's, let's try again. Um, well, Clive, while we were waiting for you, I tried to to match uh, the entertainment value of what you're going to be providing today, and I've, I'm sure I fell short, but at least I kept them somewhat content. So. Uh, <laughs> Can you try to uh, to uh, advance slides? Because I did see a flickering of the next yep. slide. All right. Yeah, it seems to be working now. I don't. I, I rebooted oh. and I've come back, so it seems to be seems to be good. Okay, so um, so let me uh, let me kick off. So um, so yeah, I wanted to talk a little bit about um, sorry, satellite technology because we've got an interesting um, backstory. Um, and uh, then I think, as Charles said, I'll um, I'll talk a little bit about um, Lunar Pathfinder, which is our um, our most exciting um, mission that we're we're currently 
uh, running. Uh, but Surrey Satellite Technology, we're, we're based in uh, Guildford in um, the universe, sorry, Guildford, uh, just adjacent to, uh, to Surrey University. Uh, Guildford is a, an old market town around about um, half an hour from, um, from central uh, London. And, and this slide just gives some, um, some information. We're a relatively small company. We're around about 400 um, people and we've, we've launched over um, 70 satellites and, and missions um, since we were established back in 1985. But the story really starts back in 1981 when a, um, a lecturer at the University of Surrey called Martin Sweeting. And that, that's a gentleman right in the middle of the the picture in um, what must have been very fashionable in, um, in 1981. I think they were called safari jackets. Um, and he is um, standing with his um, merry men having built um, UOSAT-1, um, University Satellite 1 at um, the University of um, Surrey. And um, Martin Sweeting's satellite, USAT-1 was, I suppose, one of, if not the pioneer of a, the, the concept of, of um, small satellites based on, on COTS um, equipment. It was around about 50 kilograms. Um, it had a RCA-1802 um, central processor with 16K of, of RAM. Um, and um, it carried a number of um, payloads um, and, and experiments to, uh, to principally measure the electromagnetic uh, properties of, um, of, of the Earth, and also some um, uh, radio um, beacons that actually went on to be used by a lot of um, amateur, I suppose, ham radio enthusiast, enthusiasts around the, um, around the world. Um, and emission was only envisaged to, to, um, to function for around about two years, but in fact it went on to um, to function for, for nearly nine years. And part of a payload was a, a very simple um, CCD uh, camera, um, 256 by 256. And um, this was the first picture it took um, of uh, Corsica and, um, and, and Sardinia, uh, very, um, rough um, imagery, um, but a reflection of, uh, um, I suppose, the uh, COTS um, state-of-the-art um, capabilities in, 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 in those days when you have a budget um, to try and build a satellite um, starting with a hundred pounds. So, um, so, uh, Martin was very, Martin Sweeting was very entrepreneurial in, in actually, you know, getting things moving and um, kind of cannibalizing um, uh, elements or, or components well, um, f f to, to build the, um, to build the satellite. And so USAT-1 was the, the, the first satellite that was, um, was built by um, I suppose, Surrey Satellite Technology. At the time, we hadn't, um, at that stage, we were still part of the university. And then a, a few years later, um, Martin persuaded the university to spin his team out into a kind of commercial uh, company. And we still reside in the research park next to the, um, to the University of um, Surrey. And there is a little bit of a link with them. Um, the US or, or, or with South Africa, depending on, um, on, on how you view Elon Musk. But um, actually, Martin became quite close friends with Elon Musk because in the early days of, um, of uh, sorry, satellite technology, Martin was looking for low cost launch vehicles um, from the, I suppose, the, the former Soviet Union. Um, and looking to kind of repurpose 
ICBMs, and we've got some we've got some uh, lovely footage of um, of some of our early satellites being launched by repurposed ICBMs because you get this um, kind of ejection of the the rocket and it kind of hangs in midair for a split second before it it um, you know it, it it properly launches and um, Martin and Elon Musk became um, and remain close friends and our first shareholder was actually um, Elon Musk and um, uh, and so to a certain extent I guess it's SpaceX at the time Elon was looking for um, uh, I suppose rocket engine technology um, and um, uh, over time obviously he went off and developed his um, successful um, space company and um, the other major shareholder was the University of Surrey and they wanted to realize their investment and, and expand um, the university and so um, we were acquired um, by Airbus, um, I think just over around about 10 years ago. Um, and so Airbus bought um, all the shares and we operate as a, um, uh, a subsidiary of uh, Airbus um, to a certain extent at, at arm's length. So we retain our independent brand. Um, we have a kind of unique, I suppose, you know, UK identity. Um, our um, facility is here in the in the UK, and and since you were sat in 1981, we we have gone from strength to strength, and a little bit by serendipity, one of our recent satellites that we launched back in 2019, its first image was nearly identical to um, to Eurosat one in in 1981, um, which um, which is a wonderful kind of fisheye. Um, image of uh, of the Med mediterranean and 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 uh, corsica and, and and sardinia uh and sicily and, and this time you can you can really see um you know the the outline of the, the coastline of of um of italy and um so rather than being a, a 256 by 256 pixel ccd this this is actually a an image from a raspberry pi um camera as part of a kind of single board um computer and we we just decided to to fly it um on a on a demo mission that was containing um a new generation of um of avionics and, and some other um uh, you know some other um components and, and experiments and um it took this lovely Lovely picture, which was nearly identical to the to the first um, picture that that Eurosat one took in in 1981. Um, so uh, this next slide just gives you a sense of some of the the missions that we've been in, involved in, and um, kind of gives a, a context of 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 where we've where we've come to, as it were, and and and. Um, I'll show another slide with our kind of current missions, which is a kind of lead into um, to talking a bit about Lunar Pathfinder. But um, uh, yeah, so starting bottom left, um, former Sat Seven or, or Cosmic Seven, no um, better known in the US, flew on the last Falcon um, Heavy. Um, this was a, a joint program between um, NOAA in, in, in the US and, um, and, and Taiwan. And we, we built the, um, the bus. The mission is to um, monitor, um, monitor, I suppose, for, 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 for cyclones and typhoons, principally in the, in, in the Pacific. And so we, we built the buses for, for Cosmic 7. You may be aware of that mission. Um, we've had a long-standing and productive relationship with General Atomics in um, in the U.S. So, um, so again, on the last Falcon Heavy was um, a mission called OTB-1, which was essentially a SSTL uh, bus um, supplied to General Atomics and then um, integrated with the Deep Space Atomic Clock from um, 
from Los Alamos and again flew on the Falcon um, Heavy. Uh, removed debris, you may be aware of this mission. It was to kind of um, showcase um, debris removing um, capabilities um, in space and um, flew from the um, International Space Station. It had had a, a target, um, I suppose, CubeSat, um, and then a, a net and a, a harpoon and then a drag sail. Um, and so we were, um, we were one of the principal organizations involved in, in, uh, in remove debris. Uh, Leo phase one, we, we built um, the uh, first, first satellite that proved um, the first space, I suppose, terrestrial uh, 5G call. Um, Elsa D, we're one of the technology providers for Astroscale. Um, uh, we built uh, Novasar S, which is an S band uh, SAR for. Which is which is used by the UK and um, an Australian uh, government plus um, some some other countries, um, and we also bought, built uh, Quantum, um, which was the first fully software definable small satellite for Utilsat developed between us and um, and, and Airbus. Um, some of our ongoing missions, I'll, I'll hold back Lunar Pathfinder and, and Moonlight to, to, to talk about. Um, in a couple of minutes, um, but we we've built all of the payloads for for Galileo, um, and um, yeah, in excess of around about 30, 30 payloads. So the, the the kind of integration of the atomic clocks and the um, and the payloads are done in um, in, in Guildford in the UK. Um, we're just building a climate change monitoring mission using um, GNSS reflectometry. So rather than decoding the GNSS, um, I suppose, messages, looking at the attenuation of those signals as they, um, you know, they, they bounce off the earth, gives an indication of the of a water content of um, of a planet, and is obviously a you know a, a good way to understand that you know um, the impact of climate change in terms of um, you know for example whether the marshlands around major rivers are, are, are increasing or, or shrinking um, the depths of ice, and if deserts um, you know and drought areas are are, um, are expanding. Um, what else? Um, yeah, we're, we're building um, the first of a constellation for uh, another climate change monitoring mission with a company called um, Satellite View. What they want to do is, is monitor the heat signature of um, buildings um, using a high resolution compact medium wave infrared detector, which we, we, we developed uh, for them. Um, and um, their approach is to, to supply that information on, um, you can imagine the heat signature or heat loss in, in buildings, but also you can imagine in, in, in factories and industrial facilities, um, you know, looking for areas where, where energy is being um, excessively lost um, to improve um, energy efficiency. So we're building the uh, first, in fact, we're just about to start building the second of, of, a, of a small constellation. Um, we were involved in a James Webb um, telescope, so one of the spectrometers uh, near spec um, was supplied by Airbus, but we built the uh, the IFU, the Integral Field Unit um, for uh, near spec. So we're really um excited about the fact that we've we've, we've contributed to um to the james webb um telescope and obviously there's been some very um yeah some fantastic um images have have, have been released um recently so um 
our approach is is very much around um, an architecture that allows us to build um, highly customizable um, small satellites all the way from typically kind of 25, 50 kilograms um, upwards. Um, we do do CubeSats, but they're typically for kind of training and um, space capacity development. Our sweet spot tends to be, as you can imagine, in that kind of 100 to 150 kilogram um, uh, space. Although, you know, we, we, we build um, satellites that are quite, quite a lot bigger than that based on a, a scalable architecture. So we, we have a scalable architecture and then we can kind of, um, you know, increase the, the power requirements or, or modify the structure or, um, you know, add different um, proportion systems. Um, and it means that we can adapt our, um, our architecture for, um, for all sorts of, um, uses be them um, science or earth observation or um, space situational awareness um, and we in that sense do um, or deliver all the all the flavors of of satellites um, whether it be in comms or earth observation optical eo or sar and also i think um, fairly uh, unusual, um, you know, we, we have experience in, in, in LEO, in MEO, we, we, we built GOVA, which was a pathfinder mission for uh, Galileo, the European GNSS. Um, and we built um, a small geo for, 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 for UTILSAT. So we've got that, um, that breadth of, of capability uh, across the different flavors of um, uh, of, of satellite applications, but also for different um, different orbits. And we're also particularly known for our kind of payload capability. I think because we've been going now for for um, for forty years, we've got this kind of cadre of um, of skilled and and um, capable engineers. And to a certain extent, we we're kind of a company that kind of can turn ourselves you know our hands to, to, to pretty much anything we still retain very close links to university of surrey so there's a quite a nice symbiosis there but we also have a lot of links to um to other universities in in in, in the uk university of Le leicester imperial college and and of course you know the broader um global um university um community um and um yeah, it just gives some some sense of some of the instrumentation that we've we've built over the years, um, you know, including the CRIS hyperspectral imager, which I think is the um, European Space Agency's longest serving, um, uh, yeah, payload. And the other dimension, which is I think a, a little bit different about SSTL, and and it, it kind of plays to the fact that we evolved. Uh, as a spin out of a university is, is um, since the company was created, we've always had this focus on kind of training and development and, and capacity building um, all, all the way back um, from, the, from the early 1980s, where we've helped a number of countries to develop their space um, capability. Uh, these, these, um, these programs are often, you can imagine, multi-year and involved training um, um, engineers from 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 these countries. As an example, we've we've recently had quite a sizable mission. If you look top left, uh, nearly fifty engineers from Thailand rotating back and forth. That we've been training them to build not just a, a small satellite, but um, uh, a high resolution optical imager. Um, and we've also been working with the Thai um, industrial base, kind of mentoring um, Thai industry on the requirements um, of working in, in space. Um, and um, we've supported Thailand indigenously to, to, to develop some additional payloads that will go on the, um, on the spacecraft. So this, um, this story about um, supporting 
um, other countries, I think, to develop the space capability, you know, feeds back to our lineage, um, uh, having, you know, spun out of a university um, and, and, um, and the fact that we reside very, very closely with the university, we, we're right next door. So often these programs have a, an element of master's degrees or PhDs. Um, so, a, you know, a group of people will come, some of them will de join the different engineering teams, but some of them will, will also spend time, um, you know, developing their, their academic um, capability. Okay, so that was a, a little introduction, and now what I was going to do was was jump in and um, and talk a little bit about um, Lunar Pathfinder and um, and also M Moonlight. Um, happy to take some questions now, or we can just take them at the end once once I finish the um, um, the Lunar Pathfinder um, presentation. Um, okay can you guys um can you guys see this okay uh see your see the powerpoint program rather than uh presentation mode but yes okay um do you want me to make a change or uh, can you put it into like your, are you going to continue with the PowerPoint right now? We see um, the application and then the, the thank you slide. Okay. So are you um, okay? Go. Yeah. Okay. Let me, let me share this one. Just, just hang on a minute. Okay. Um, I was really interested while you're doing that. I, I was interested um, in all of it, but particularly as a Raspberry Pi fan, I found that pretty intriguing in the use of of that in one of the applications. Yeah, and we we I mean, it really was just a kind of an add on. I don't I, I, talking to to some of the engineers. We didn't um, we didn't we didn't know whether it would would work or function, and we didn't. Um, we didn't make any significant modifications to it, but it but it but it worked it worked well, and it took that lovely picture, which, um, as I said, harks back to um, you know the first picture that was taken by Eurosat um, one back in um, in the nineteen eighties. Um, Very cool. One second. Does your involvement with the James Webb Space Telescope allow you pre-public viewing of some of the images? No, I don't think it does. Um, no, I think we we were one of many um, organizations that 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 we were involved that were involved. Um, Certainly, on that near spec, there were a number of UKs. We worked with um, organisations supporting the, the the development. We worked closely, very closely, with the University of Durham um, on on the IFU. Um, but um, but just excited that we you know that we made a um, sure made a contribution. Um, okay. Um, Let's um, uh, let's try and push on with um, uh, with this. Just a minute. Um, can you see that? Okay. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Do. So, um, so Lunar Pathfinder. Um, so, um, what this will deliver is the first um, data relay spacecraft to connect lunar missions back to Earth. Um, and our target 
to fly this as, as part of Eclipse mission in, in 2025. Uh, and the mission came about from um, some analysis that we, we looked at, which actually forecast that there would be a significant increase in um, lunar missions over the, over the next two decades. Um, and you can see this, you can obviously see there's a little bit of ebb and flow as there's different peaks and different missions go. But overall, the, tra the trend is up. Um, and um, clearly, the ramp up of missions over time and the data volume requirements will put um, a significant demand on, on direct to earth um, communication networks and, and a different approach, or rather a complementary approach, I, I guess, is, 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 is required. And so um, Lunar Pathfinder is, um, is developed, um, sponsored, funded by, by, um, by ESA and, um, and done as a partnership between ESA and, and NASA. Um, and um, it delivers a data relay solution for, um, for any location, be it far side or polar on near side, and it will also support um, any type of um, asset, be it you know a, a surface lander, a rover, um, or but or an orbiter, um, and it fundamentally solves that kind of line of sight problem because if you're um, on the far side, it's it's self evident you you can't um, have line of sight, um, and. It also, to a certain extent, enables the um, some of the kind of commercial um, missions that will come because um, it will mean that those um, uh, those missions won't have to factor in kind of um, direct to earth um, communication, and therefore they can um, engineer hopefully a, a more um, you know, a cheaper, lower, lower mass, more cost-effective um, solution. So it has um, uh, UHF and S-band uh, links to uh, the moon, and then it has an X-band um, Earth link. Um, so the Earth link is around about five megabits per second, and then the moon link um, is dependent on whether it's um, S-band or um, UHF. It also has a number of other um, uh, elements. It has a uh, laser retro reflector for, for ranging, and it also has a GNSS um, uh, signal detector. And of course, there's been a lot of um, analysis or, or, or I suppose forecasting of how much GNSS um, signals will will reach um, the moon but this will be the first um, satellite that, that should be able to, to, to validate it and of course moving forward having um, a robust GNSS solution for the moon will be will be important because um, I guess just the, 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 the terrain leads itself to, um, to needing to know um, exactly where you are. And I, I, I certainly, for one, wouldn't want to be kind of <laughs> venturing too far from, um, from my lander when um, pretty much um, one impact crater looks probably very much like, like the next um, impact crater. So we um, we developed a, a, a mission builder app, um, and what what this gives is it allows you to enter into uh, the app um, some characteristics of your requirements or, or your mission, um, and then it will give you a, a kind of forecasted coverage and, and performance report. Um, so it gives you a kind of picture of what what kind of comms. Um, capabilities that that um that you would receive and it, it it's quite a nice stepping stone for uh for a for a discussion with 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 us um 
the majority of the um, the bandwidth will be taken by um, ESA and um, NASA, but um, in in that agreement, um, we SSTL have been actively encouraged, and we wanted it this way that we would retain a a chunk of a of a bandwidth um, to support um, commercial. Um, um landers and rovers and um, orbiters around the um around around the moon to to kind of stimulate that that broader um lunar um ecosystem um from a, a science perspective um one of the first missions that we we um we understand that we'll be supporting is a Lucy um, mission. Now this is a, a US mission, lunar surface ele electromagnetic experiment developed by uh, UC um, Berkeley. Um, and uh, it'll be, I understand one of the first missions to the to the far side um, of, of the moon and it will land on the Schrodinger uh, basin. Now uh, we'll measure uh, electromagnetic environment and and how that electromagnetic environment interacts with the lunar uh, dust environment, which of course will be um, will be critical um, for when um, the first human beings re return to the uh, to the moon. Um, it will also have uh, um, a radio telescope capability which i understand will be the first us radio telescope on the moon and um, that uh, capability uh, will give input to um, what um, we assume will be evolution and the build out of of more sophisticated uh, radio telescopes over time um, so lucy is 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 one of the missions that we uh, we will support um and um it, it it is it is possible or it's likely that we, we we could fly with them as part of the clips um transport to to the moon uh, we don't know exactly um who that will be with and the exact timing but that that's a discussion that's ongoing at the moment and it's part of the ESA nasa kind of barter and collaboration um you know, on 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 the moon mission. Um, so, East of Moonlight um, initiative. This is really the the evolution of a, a full comms and nav solution for um, for the moon. I, I guess it's analogous with uh, Lunar Net in, in in the US, and I suppose at some stage there could well be some convergence or collaboration between those um, di different programs. Um, so ESA has selected two uh, consortiums, which are um, principally based in the U in, sorry, in Europe, and um, we are leading um, one of them. And you can see some of the companies uh, along the bottom of a slide that were, were, were who are part of, in essence, um, our team. And the investigation is um, is ongoing for a full um lunar a constellation and and navigation system uh, with defining uh, both the technical and commercial infrastructure um, and this will go forward to an ESA um, ministerial um, which is scheduled for um, the end of um, uh, this year and then we would obviously hope that we were you know our um, our consortium is is selected, and, and we, you know, we progress with the um, you know the detailed design and, and the build out of a uh, of a constellation, building um, on the Lunar Pathfinder um, uh, mission that um, that's um, ongoing at the moment, and as I said, uh, will be in service in in twenty twenty five. So yeah, just to run through some of the, I was really just kind of summarize some of the, the benefits of a lunar communication and, and navigation system 
it, it solves the, um, the, the the problem of line of sight and and, and direct to earth reduces the cost for, for lunar emissions um, because you 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 then then can enable you know simpler lighter cheaper comms we're working with um, uh, JPL and uh, kinetic in in the UK to um, to have a, a number of validated um, user comms um, um, subsystems uh, everything from from very um, low power um, small um, devices that I suppose could go on 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 a, a, a simple um, lander or rover to to um, to more sophisticated and and um, you know more powerful and more capable uh, systems. So we're um, we've got a range of of um, of end user terminals to meet um, a range of different um, I suppose end customer uh, requirements. Uh, should enable better performance um, so in terms of um, data rates and um, and comms, uh, obviously greater uh, navigation accuracy over time when you have a, a, a GNSS um, capability in Constellation. Um, and it, uh, it should offload some of the... Um, um, demands on the deep space network, uh, which is typically oversubscribed. Um, and uh, over time, the, the moonlight constellation will provide, um, yeah, an, an enhanced coverage, um, you know, beyond what we will be able to offer with, with a single uh, relay satellite. So yeah, so we're excited um, about building um, Pathfinder. Um, we see it as um, contributing to the lunar ecosystem. Um, hopefully, um, you know, supporting and, and stimulating, um, you know, more not just um, institutional scientific missions from the likes of um, NASA and ESA, but also to support the kind of the commercial um, ventures, where um, obviously the first requirements is to have you know some some telemetry and some com links um, back to um, back to Earth, and um, yeah, we're, we're we're excited over Pathfinder, and we see the opportunity to evolve Pathfinder into to Moonlight, um, harness um, some of the the capabilities we've got in GNSS and, and bring that dimension to um, to the moon as um, as being really um, yeah really really exciting for for SSTL yeah and that was it any questions great thank you so much for a really interesting presentation. How did the um, how did uh, you know if you could go back and kind of elaborate on how the um, your company's involvement with the Lunar Pathfinder mission kind of came about? I mean, you gave a history of like forty years of um, work, particularly, I also found it very interesting, 40 years of what it seemed helping other countries and advising them and so forth. Uh, so it sounds like it would be a logical involvement of um, your your company in the, the mission, but how did that, could you elaborate on how that all came about? Yeah, I, I think it, I think it was a number of factors. I think the, the, the first is that I think because we we spun out of um, the University of Surrey, um, we've always had um, you know we've always had this strong link to um, to the science community, um, and I think we've developed a, um, 
a kind of can can do attitude and a, a, a focus on on innovation and always kind of looking to 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 to, to do things uh differently and um looking at um different kind of mission opportunities just just to kind of stretch and and and, and develop the, the the company um the the lunar the lunar pathfinder mission really did come from that i, I showed that slide on some of the analysis where we i suppose we started to think about well what 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 um you know what will be the requirements and 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 in the near future in terms of um the kind of capabilities that will be required uh, around the the moon and what what what's what's realistic for a for a small um entrepreneurial company to um to address and and the, the comms dimension i think you know became you know more more evident and we we did um actually quite a lot of of that um analysis on on the on the likely um growth on or or the, requ the requirements for um for comms capacity um ourselves and and started then to 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 um you know to to talk to to ESA principally about you know we've done this analysis it really tell really you know tells um us that uh, you know and tells the community that there is going to be this need um and um you know we've got some ideas about technically how to to, to fulfill that you know in a cost effect a cost efficient way that builds on our um cots design methodology so we worked for a long time just i suppose reinforcing and 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 promoting the fact that there was an, a need and this need was going to come relatively quickly um so we took came you know our approach was very much kind of from an, a needs perspective and then of, of course then linking the fact that we had the the, the technical i suppose prowess and, and heritage to actually you know de de develop um uh you know uh, uh, an efficient solution you know i, I the science and, and this is definitely a, a science space geek speak situation with uh, um, everybody here, but I, I have to say that 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 business aspect, the business development aspect really intrigues me as well is it goes to show that where you identify a need. Um, and you start talking about the need and then demonstrating that that you've you have the technology and the capability to fill that need uh is really um it, it really goes to show that you know get out there and and make it happen and, and you kind of obviously it was fortunate in in your company's perspective but um you did make it happen by by discussing that are there any other questions from uh people mike you usually have very very good questions where you're on mute. Can't, still can't hear you, Mike. Oh, okay, now can you hear me? Yes. Yep. Okay, yeah. Um, yeah, I think a very good presentation. Uh, thank you, Glee. That's uh, that's very interesting uh, information. And um, I I have heard now maybe um, this is not correct, but I have heard that it, we are we would be very challenged to uh, go to the moon and land on the exact spot that we want to land on. For instance, if we wanted to go to Tranquility Base and land where the Apollo 11 mission landed, uh, we would be hard pressed and challenged to. Uh, to land in in that area because we don't know where it is we, we know where, where it is approximately but apparently if you send a lander down there it spent all the fuel looking for the landing site and and, and maybe couldn't find it hmm. so uh that that may not be correct there may be a way to find it but maybe uh cleve you have uh, 
come across this uh, this problem, and how how would how would you support landing on a particular or navigate to a particular landing site uh, that's uh, very accurate so that you wouldn't waste too much fuel looking for it uh, when you're circling around? Is there, yeah, is that... I, I think I think it's um, yeah, I think it's exactly why the the we want to first of all validate how much gnss how much gps you know galileo um information is 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 received um on the moon because ultimately if you want to have a um a, 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 an accurate positioning system you need to have a a gnss a gps type um solution around the moon and um it, 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 it will absolutely be critical, as you say, to 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 um, to nav navigate accurately. I mean, if if the if the one of the focus areas is is you know looking at at, at the resource aspect of the of a moon in terms of I, I suppose water ice, the ability to really you know uh, detect it and then be able to accurately say. You know where it is down to the, you know, to 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 a meter or two, will be critical. And and um, the obvious way to achieve that is G GNSSS. Um, as I understand it, I mean there are some concepts of intermediate solutions with with some form of, you know, ground based um, um, transmitters that would you know that could give some element of of positioning but the ultimate solution has got to be a an orbital based constellation um similar to to to, to what we we have on earth i mean we we rely on it um hugely for for uh, for navigation and um it, you know it, 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 it's the um it's the obvious solution over time for for the moon Right, and uh, I uh, I wrote NASA a letter suggesting that one of their first places to land on the moon would be uh, the Apollo 11 landing site, mm -hmm. uh, because as uh, as Charles knows, uh, there is a uh, requirement to uh, uh, consider those sites uh, like a national park, uh, some some area where you would not allow commercial companies to come in and you know take things out. Yep. Uh, and and build a uh, McDonald's hamburger stand right next to it or something. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And not to get ridiculous, but uh, but some protection is needed around those historic sites. And uh, so I suggested that one of the first missions that they go to the moon and and actually uh, rope off the area of uh, where where Apollo 11 landed, so that you don't. Uh, have commercial companies come in there and and mess it up, so to speak. Yeah. And so, uh, and and they kind of rebuffed that. They they said that's not necessary or or whatever. But but I think eventually it will be. Not for the first time, but but eventually. Mm. So, uh, I think uh, this uh, uh, program that you have here is going to be very uh, uh, very uh, valuable in uh, in establishing uh, navigation capabilities around the moon and on the moon. Yeah. For one of, for many reasons, and that was one of them. Um, yeah. Now I I know a manager at NASA who is a, a communications manager. Uh, his name is uh, uh, Jim Shearer. Do you do you happen to know him? Um, no, I I I I don't. Make perhaps members of of um, of the Luna team uh, do. Um, but. Okay, I just was curious. Thanks. Yeah. Yeah. Anybody else? Any other questions? Can you, are there any other future projects that you can talk about or where you see the technology going? Um, as I mentioned, the, the, the follow on from, uh, from Pathfinder will be, um, you know, will be moonlight. We, there is a ESA ministerial decision on on funding at the end of the year and we hope that um 
SSTL and a consortium we're working with is, is selected. Um, uh, I'd say, uh, you know, the concepts within Pathfinder and, and Moonlight and, and LunarNet, which is a, the US equivalent, they're absolutely applicable also, of course, to, to Mars. You, 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 you will want, um, you know, a, a comms service there and um, you want a comm service that, that offloads from the deep space network and that, you know, um, doesn't, doesn't restrict you to, to, to direct to Earth. And you will ultimately want a, 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 a navigating, navigation and positioning uh, solution. So um, certainly from, a, from our, our perspective, SSTL's perspective, we're, we're you know, we're focused on on the moon um, and supporting mankind's um, return to the moon. But um, suffice to say, we 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 absolutely have a, a long term ambition to to take you know some of the, the capabilities that you know we will have um, developed for um, you know on on the moon to to to, to Mars. So um, I think. You know, there will always be a requirement for communications, and there will always be a requirement for um, for navigation and, and positioning, and um, in, in interplanetary exploration, whether it's you know Mars or or you know some of the means of um, of Saturn, these these fundamental requirements will be required. So. Building capability right. around um, around the moon is 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 a first step. Right. Great. Anybody else? Uh, and are you going to return to IAC? this uh, September? Yes, I, I, I will be there and there'll be a bunch of people from um, from SSTL. So if, if you're in town, it would be lovely to um, to meet you. Please come and stop by our stand and we can, um, you know, we can share the latest on, on Lunar Pathfinder. Um, I will also be um, across at SmallSats in, in Logan. Oh, in, all right, in... I'll be there there as well. So okay, great. yeah. So we'll have a stand there as well. So come and come and say hello. Um, we we uh, we've been, I suppose, contributing to to small sats. I think pretty much since its inception. I think um, I think we're one of the we're one of the um, the first um, I suppose non US organization or commercial companies to um, to contribute. Great, fantastic. Yeah, I will definitely stop by. Well, if there are no any other questions, uh, and certainly anybody speak up, but I really want to thank you on behalf of all of us, and particularly um, Svetlana, for taking the time and giving a great presentation and um, informative perspective. That was it's a pleasure. Really great. Mm -hmm. All right, everybody. Well, with that, have a great Saturday, have a great weekend, and we will uh, talk with you all next Saturday. And Clive, certainly, and is it Clive or? Yeah, it's Clive, Clive. Okay. Yeah. Um, I, I think I can also convey from Svetlana that you're always welcome to stop by and have a coffee on a, on a Saturday morning at Space Geek Speak. So, <laughs> There's nothing further. I wish you all a great weekend and thanks again, Clive. Yep. Great. Nice to speak to you.